and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we call upon you today that you would indeed please us with your presence, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon each this morning, and that you would that we might lift up our voices and praise unto you to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in the life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. We want to just give a word of welcome to all. We are gathered this morning with a very difficult task before us, uh, but we do face that with hope. It's my privilege. Um, I've been a, a, a personal friend of, the, of at least a portion of the family for some time. My name is Dr. Maynard Kerner. I'm president of Heidelberg Seminary in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, And so as we seek to celebrate this morning the hope of redemption, we want to together encourage the family uh, as well. We'll begin by looking at several different scripture passages. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, Psalm 124, 8. As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Psalm 103, 13 and 14. For he brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. 1 Timothy 6, 7. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1, 21. And finally, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble and with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, our Father in heaven, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Lead us, we pray, to put our trust entirely in you. We come to you in the name of our only begotten and well-beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, <coughs> Excuse me. who died for our sins and rose again. We beseech you to grant us peace and pardon through his precious blood and joy in the Holy Spirit. And seeing that we have in Christ a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, we come boldly to your throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help us in time of need. We thank you for the precious promises of your word. We praise you for the light of the gospel. And we acknowledge your sovereign will and infinite compassion. Be pleased, therefore, to look upon our sorrow for the sake of your dear Son, enable us to hear your holy word, so that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we may have hope. Grant us the consolation and peace of the Holy Spirit. May we hold fast our confidence in your forgiving mercy and the blessed assurance of eternal life. We pray through Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, who rose from the dead, and is exalted to your right hand. Amen. Th at this time, would you please join together uh, using the song sheets, singing Like a River Glorious.
family and friends of Lawrence Klein, I recall 33 years ago in the spring asking my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, in that dreaded four-hour trip from Dort College to Pella, what to expect in meeting her dad. She gave a very straightforward answer. He's just an ordinary guy who loves the Lord. Christy was half right. He certainly loved the Lord, but he was no ordinary guy. He was no ordinary guy because he loved the Lord. We live in a day and age when children are being raised without knowing their dads. I was immensely spoiled because I had two fathers who loved the Lord, their spouses, their children, and their extended family. And they loved the church. Lawrence loved the church. He loved Calvary Christian Reformed Church. And the only reason why he ever left this fellowship was to join me in planting one in Pella, a Reformed Presbyterian church, because he knew he, he could supplement the numbers. But he loved the fellowship here, and so it's befitting that we meet in this building with many who know him. Lawrence Klein made sure that I understood that there is no in-law after the word son. He was a devoted man who soon after his retirement in his mid-70s became his wife's caretaker after she endured a medical event. He spent his retirement as he did those 50 plus years selling tires, doing what he loved most, serving the Lord whom he loved in whatever role God gave him. When I became his pastor, he offered me good counsel. He said once, I am no father-in-law Jethro, and you're no Moses. But when, son, you preach, and when you see me leaning over in the pew, that means you've said enough. <laughs> they always put it straight with me. And the times we'd come home and have Sunday meals, he would, he would tell me you could tweak this or that, son. And I appreciated always his counsel. When he was recently hospitalized and spent a short time in assisted living, the family was busy cleaning the house and, and getting things organized. And I came across decades worth of these little Mead notebooks in which Lawrence had meticulously itemized tire orders for the myriads of gas stations and service centers on its route across Iowa. I, I was impressed by the level of detail of, of these notebooks, of these entries. And he said, Chuck, you may have them all. In fact, that can be your inheritance. <laughs> he, he never lost his wit. But what these notebooks attest to is the faithfulness of a man who provided for his wife Valda, for his son Jeff, and for his daughter Christy. And when I told him how impressed I was at this record of service, he said without a beat, I thank the good Lord. In fact, that was his mantra. I thank the good Lord. 
just months before he experienced acute pain in his back, which ended up being a prelude for a season of excruciating affliction and eventual entrance into the church triumphant, he had thanked the Lord for his good health. Hence, he was so surprised by his rapid decline and was in mental anguish over his physical suffering. Understand, this was a man who had subscribed to Prevention Health magazine for years and religiously took his vitamin supplements. How could this happen? He asked. In such a short time. But while he was being refined by this fiery trial, he well understood this. God's grace is sufficient. And while he detested the pain and the humility of dependence, he said to us, I don't get it. I don't get it. But I thank the good Lord because for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And of course, that's Romans 8, 28. And dear friends, that's an easy text to say when life is going well and you're feeling healthy. It's an easy text to, text to relay to an individual who's going through something. But when a person suffers, suffers as he did and still confesses Christ glory be to God I thank the good Lord Lawrence Klein was no ordinary man he was a child of God justified by grace alone through faith alone on account of Christ alone and all to the glory of God alone. His suffering never robbed him of that blessed assurance, but only bolstered his trust in God. The man behind me is my boss at the seminary, a seminary that I graduated at, and he was my professor as well. He taught me many a thing. But my father-in-law taught me things I could never learn in seminary. I thank the good Lord. The, the request, I believe, of Lawrence, the family, was asked to read from Romans chapter 5. Uh, we will turn there at this time. Reading the word of God. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but the sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him, who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. But if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us look again to our God in prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, consolation of the sorrowful and support of the weary, who does not delight in grieving or afflicting the children of men, we pray that you will look down in tender love and pity upon your servants in this bereaved household whose joy has been turned into mourning. Be pleased to uphold, strengthen, and comfort them according to the multitude of your mercies so that they may not faint under your fatherly chastening, but may find in you their strength and refuge through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you will again now take your song sheets, and we will sing together, None Other Lamb, None Other Name.
our meditation this morning, we're going to be considering uh, just a couple of verses that uh, we find in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. I'm going to read the verses 24 through 28. We're going to be looking particularly at verses 25 and 26. Again, the word of God. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. God and Father, we pray that as we consider these words this afternoon, this morning, may your spirit guide us, and may you bring encouragement, may you bring comfort. In Jesus' name. Amen. We want to now turn again in the song sheet to uh, In Sweet Communion, Lord with You. Mrs. Klein, immediate family, friends, this morning we find ourselves facing the most basic reality of life. It is a reality that everyone must face, not only in terms of the real struggle of watching a loved one come to an end for his life here on earth, but it reminds us what is real for each of us here today as well. Life here on earth is short. And even when there is a full life, 83 years, the human condition on earth is frail. And all efforts throughout the history of the world to change that 
have failed. And so we find ourselves with heavy hearts, with tears. That's very real. But there's another reality, one in which we rejoice, and yes, even celebrate today. And that reality is expressed in the psalmist, here in Psalm 73, and it's expressed in the form of a confession of faith. Listen again. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's a confession of faith in God. Ultimately, we would understand that now in the New Testament, or following the New Testament, in Jesus Christ. It is a faith in which there is absolute confidence that God is alone the creator and the sustainer of life, and there is none other. It is in him and in him alone that all of the answers, all of the answers of life are found. So I want to ask you, even as you grieve, which shows humanity, it's who we are, it's good, but also put your confidence in this confession. It is a confession which expresses a close relationship with God. It is knowing God in a very intimate, personal way. It is indeed a sweet communion. This sweet communion is the reality of anyone who through Jesus Christ has come to know God. So please consider with me for a few moments what this confession implies, what it means to you. Well, let's pose that question. What does it mean to confess God? There are many who would recognize that there is a God even, and that there is some kind of importance to the fact that we ought to acknowledge him in some way. But for the psalmist, the expression of faith is a heart commitment. It's not just a statement. It is to say and to believe with full conviction. You are God and there is none other. And even in that confession, there is an acknowledgement of something, of who God is. He says, who have, have I in heaven? But you, that is to say, that God, the one and he confesses, is the one God, the only one who counts. He is the one upon whom you can call on to provide what is needed for you here on earth. The God in heaven is the God of creation, who is able, because he is the God who upholds who brought this creation into being, who upholds this creation, as it were, in the very palm of his hand, he is indeed able to meet your every need. There's no end of things that we, as mankind, that man likes to look to for happiness and for all of the answers to life, now, while God has placed us here on earth to enjoy life, to live it as God has blessed us with, we don't apologize for that at all. But the question is, what do you count on? What do you count on? To know God and confess him is to know God that in him alone there is salvation and there is life. This salvation, of course, is in Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, in verse 9, very, very simply put, if you confess with your mouth 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Those simple words, this brief statement, is the basis for your hope today. To have the conviction that in God there is hope and eternal life, this conviction is understood in terms of, of the need that is there. There's an acknowledgement that life by itself is frail. There's no hope apart from God, but with God there is hope without doubt. He alone is in heaven. So, first of all, I encourage you this morning. I call upon all of you here today. Look to this God. Every day. Know him. Trust in him. Do so by faith in Jesus Christ. But again, this confession is not just stating some words. It is more than simply to say, I love God, though we need to say that. It's important that we say that. You do need to confess your faith in Christ. But when that expression is from the heart, by means of the Holy Spirit, it deals with, again, with the reality of life. And part of the reality of life is that with all this available to life today, you know, all the things that we like to pile up for ourselves. All of the accomplishment that we look at and consider, oh, so important. Look what I've done. Look what other people are recognizing me about. To leave some type of legacy, some sort of way that I might be remembered. They are all gone. Like a puff of wind. The reality causes us to face the question, what really does count? What really does last? For the psalmist, as the man of God, confessing his faith, it did have real implications in his life. The conviction for God is not a shared conviction along with a bunch of other things here on earth. But he alone... You know, it's relatively easy to confess faith, to say, I love God, to participate in the church, to be a child of God, at least in name. But when your relationship with God is challenged with the things which can become all oh, so important in life, even life itself, health itself, then where do the loyalties lie? What do you really count on? Is it the God you confess truly God for you? Now the thing I want to point out to you this morning is that by means of the confession of a true child of God is that even as you struggle with that reality, the frailty of life, he finds that God is the answer. God is the answer. To honor God as the one true God is then to know that this God does in fact meet your needs. The very needs that you have today. The child of God is first of all concerned about the things of God. The upholding, that is, of the honor of his name. His focus is upon God. And when you know God, when you desire God above all else, when you truly honor him, then your strength, your comfort, your ability to go forward, it's all in God. You can look to him today in that very way. Finally, the confession of the psalmist expressed in terms of sweet communion with God is one of great confidence on the part of the child of God. When faced with the reality of life, he does not falter. 
His hope is steadfast in God. He even notes his confidence in God in, in the contrast to the frailty of life. He says, well, I know that the things of this world and even life will fail. God will not. And I know that. But that is not to just say, well, okay, that means I need to be, uh, 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 really need to work hard at this. I need to fight with all those temptations. They are there every day. When you go through the end, when you're dealing with extreme pain and, and things like that, I just need to fight against it. The real desire for God is the acknowledgement that God does really meet your needs. And with the fullness of redemption, this begins with the blood of Christ is the covering for your sin. When you seek him to truly honor him as God in the way expressed here is to realize in him that there is real satisfaction. There's real comfort. There's a real answer even to the struggle of pain. Again, the psalmist speaks of the heart. He says, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion. Much more so than even the, the, the failing of the flesh, which ultimately happens with everyone where the heart fails. More so, He's talking about the spiritual condition. Even when I grow weak in my faith, he says, I know that God is there as my strength. The confession of faith then is the basis for confidence. Earlier, a reference was made to Romans 8:28 and the understanding of life from that perspective. I want to note, as Paul continues that thought in Romans 8, 31 and following, it says, what then shall we say to these things? Yes, the very things that you are dealing with, the struggles and frailties of human life, death itself, when life fails, that's the question. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know what we have noted here very briefly in these few words is a very brief glimpse into who God is, into who man is, who we are. And that the faith of a child of God knows something of this and understands its implications. Now, on the one hand, even to stop just for a moment to think about that, how amazing that is. That this God who is the creator, who alone is in heaven, that you can know him. And that he cares for you. That God in his immeasurable grace is your God who is there for you with all that you need. And yet there is something even more basic and fantastic here. Foundational to this expression of faith is the fact that the creator God calls you, the child of God, to not just know him, but to be in communion with him. To say that God is the strength of my heart and my portion is to say, I have come to know this God and to enjoy fellowship. That fellowship with God is what life really is. That is what is precious. It's important beyond anything else. Yes, that's that sweet communion. Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians that we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We have hope not only of eternal life, but of the resurrection. This frail body will be raised as a glorious body. 
That hope is expressed in this fellowship. Now while there's an emptiness when there is a loss, there is something else which is complete. I did not know Mr. Klein terribly well. I had on several occasions the opportunity to visit with him briefly. But I understand that the psalmist, as the psalmist, that his desire, that is Lawrence, his desire was for his God. It is what gave strength even as his body weakened. And now he has come to and knows, not just in his confession here on earth, but in the most ultimate, in the most complete way, he knows and is engaged in that sweet communion with his God. My encouragement to you, even as you have heavy hearts, rejoice as well. Yes, even today, celebrate and praise God for the reality of fellowship with him. So the reality that we do face this morning is not easy, but thanks be to God that it has brought us face to face with God. That too is an occasion that we are thankful for. The message from God is clear. Trust in Christ and you shall have life. Life in which true knowledge and fellowship with God is real. Even as it is now in that most ultimate sense for Lawrence and his fellowship with God. Amen. Again, in your song sheet, our final hymn listed there, God be with you till we meet again.
Due to the uh, weather conditions outside, we are going to, at this time, do the committal service, first of all here uh, in the front, um, and then there will also be a uh, military rights observed uh, as the casket is taken out in front, and then the burial will just be by uh, the funeral undertaker taking care of that. So, want to, on behalf of the family, thank all of you for coming today. Um, and to be sure to remind you that there is a time of fellowship which you are invited to. The family would like to have you stay and have that time as well together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have destroyed death by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. You have sanctified the graves of the saints by his rest in the tomb and have brought life and immortality to light by his glorious resurrection so that all who die in him abide in hope concerning their bodies and joy in their souls. We pray that you will receive our sincere thanks for the victory over death and the grave which he has obtained for us and for all who sleep in him. Now keep us who are still in the body in everlasting fellowship with all that wait for you on earth and with all who are around you in heaven. And may we all remain in union with Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, and who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God and his wise providence to take the soul of our deceased brother, Lawrence Klein, out of this world, we therefore commit his body to the ground, looking for the general resurrection in the last day and the life of the world to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works will follow them. Revelation 14, 13. I'd also like to read a, re a portion from 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment and the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
and conquered by our comrades' devotion to the responsibility, freedom of, our, of this country. The white stripes boldly proclaim the peace that he helped bring to our future generations. This is his way. This is our spiritual inheritance. Receive it with the tears of our minds and the faith of our hearts. on behalf of the United States government, more importantly on behalf of a grateful nation, for your husband's honorable and faithful service to our country, we present you this flag today. Thank you with this girl that explains the third 